Hi, I'm Phil. I've written a bunch of management books, including Message Not Received. I am a speaker, consultant, and recognized technology expert. And one more thing, I'm an enormous fan of the show, Breaking Bad. Any Breaking Bad fans out there? For those of you who don't know of the show, I'll just describe it briefly. It's about a high school chemistry teacher, Walter White, 50 years old, finds out he has terminal lung cancer and wants to provide for his family. What do you do if you have an acute knowledge of chemistry and not much time to live? You start manufacturing crystal meth. And just to prove to you what a Breaking Bad nut I am, this is me as Heisenberg for Halloween. And this is one of my prized possessions. Season one DVD signed by Vince Gilligan, the showrunner, as well as Anna Gunn, who plays Skylar White. So be warned, today's talk is replete with pop culture references. And I will be doing a little trivia and giving away some copies of the new book. If you haven't, make sure that your phones are off. And here is my plan of attack. I'm going to talk for around 40 minutes and then take around five minutes worth of questions. And here are my goals. I want to inform you. I want to provoke some questions. And most important, I want to make you think a little bit differently about how you communicate at work. And when I put together this book and the talks around this book, I thought it was really important early on to put forth a disclaimer of sorts, because to me, communication is fundamentally personal. What devices do you use? iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. What words do you use? These are very personal things. And if I didn't put a disclaimer out there, I feel like this could come off as a little condescending. So right off the bat, I am not omniscient. There is plenty that I don't know, although I do know a lot about Breaking Bad. I am not Dale Carnegie. I am not the world's best communicator. And sometimes people don't understand me. Sometimes I don't understand other people. But I've gotten a lot better at communication over my career. Early on, it was one of my greatest professional liabilities. And finally, I am not the arbiter of what is or is not jargon. When people ask for an explanation of jargon or a definition, I often think of the following line. I don't know it when I see it. And that comes from a very famous 1964 Supreme Court case. Justice Potter Stewart famously said, when asked to define pornography, I know it when I see it. Any bets on if I mentioned porn in my first five minutes? <laughs> so for almost two decades, I have dealt with bad communication in the workplace. My first book is called Why New Systems Fail, and many IT projects weren't successful ultimately because people failed to communicate. Someone forgot to tell a developer about a particularly salient requirement. Whoops, someone forgot to mention a particular deadline. And I decided when I thought about book number seven, having written books about platforms, about small businesses, about big data, that all this technology didn't mean a hill of beans unless we understood each other. And I decided to go on a mission to simplify business communication. As I'll talk about today, the solution to this problem of business communication is well within our reach. We just need to embrace new tools, ones that promote collaboration, in other words, not email, and simpler language. Now, I've had a chance over the last few days to get to know some of you, and you've hopefully got to know me a little bit, and you'll know that I'm a big fan of quotes. This is one of my favorites. Jerry Seinfeld famously said we never put, should have put a man on the moon. Why? Because now we can say to anything, we could put a man on the moon, but we can't communicate well at work. We can't manage, it, manage projects well. So those are words to live by. But one of my favorite quotes, and this one is actually on the back of the book, comes from George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright and co-founder of the London School of Economics. And he said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. I love that quote. It's very natural for us to think that we're being clear. And I'm going to show some research in a bit that indicates that most of the time, we think that we're being clear with others, right? Who thinks that he or she is not being clear, whether you're speaking, whether you're sending an email? But despite this fact, it's obvious to me that business communication is fundamentally broken. And there are two problems. A, we send way too much email. And B, we use way too much jargon. First book, what movie is this from? Who said Glenn Gary? Give him a book. Very nice. Jack Lemmon, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Think about how many emails you receive in a given day. 
odds are it's more than 100. Now, you may not realize that because we check email very frequently, right? Even when we're on vacation, a lot of us just whip out our phones. And if you do the math, if you just get 100 emails in a day and you work eight hours in a day, maybe that's not realistic, you're basically getting one every five minutes. But the problem, as I argue in the book, is not email. Some people think that I'm anti-email. I'm not. I'm just anti-inefficiency. It's 2015. There have been superior collaboration tools around for a long time. There's no excuse. Maybe back in 1998, you can say, well, we really don't have an alternative. Today, there are many viable and affordable alternatives. But default email has become the default means of communicating in the business world. And this begs the question, why are we addicted to email? Let's do the next book prize. Um, what movie is this from? I, I don't know who got it first. We'll have to do a tiebreak or something. So why is email caught on so much? Email serves a valuable business tool. And there are a bunch of reasons for this that I discovered researching the, the book. First is ubiquity. Has anyone ever heard of the term network effect? Okay. If you haven't, it breaks down like this. Let's say that I'm the only person on this planet with an email address. Email has very little utility. Why? I can't email anyone. You can't email me. I can't email you. But if everyone in this room owns an email address, then we can all email each other. The network is starting to build. What if everyone in the corporate world? What if everyone in the world? So network effects are really important. When was the last time that you received a business card that did not contain an email address? Probably a long time. Next up, email is incredibly convenient. Back in 1998, when I was starting out in my corporate career, if I wanted to check email, I needed to go into the office. Fast forward to, say, 2000. Through a laptop, I could connect to a VPN or a virtual private network. Right? These days, you know how hard it is to check email? In fact, true story, you know that gum sales are down by about 11% in the last year? Want to know why? Well, if you're of a certain age, remember that you, when you were going to the food store or to Target, and you were sitting there online and you were bored, you might pick up National Enquirer. You might pick up a pack of gum. These days, you're not doing that. You're staring at your phone. So it's become too convenient in a way for us to check email. You know how much it costs to send an email? Nothing. Anyone ever read Free by Chris Anderson? It's a really interesting book. And in 1998, 1999, Amazon.com did an experiment. They wanted to do free shipping in Europe. The problem was in France, a law prevented that. You had to charge one franc, the minimum amount. Compared to England, sales in France were 40% lower. The mere existence of any type of friction in the form of a penny or a French equivalent would stop people. I often think about whether or not if we charge someone a one penny tax per email, if that would stop them. If you saw your paycheck after two weeks, you said, what's this $15 deduction? Well, you've sent 1,500 emails. Email is also incredibly fast. It's not as fast as chat. It's not as fast as messaging. But if you go back over 15, 20 years, email used to take sometimes 10 or 15 minutes or longer to arrive. These days, it's almost instantaneous. Email is also very reliable. Over 99.99% of emails get delivered. Of course, there have been instances in which email has wound up in our spam folders. Of course, sometimes someone types in the wrong email address that doesn't get there. But most of the time, it's what they call a picnic, a problem in chair not in computer. And email is very secure. Some of you may be thinking about the Sony hack from a few months ago. That is the exception that proves the rule. Email is a very secure medium. Most of the time, we know that if I send an email to one person, it stays with that one person. Of course, we've all hit reply all by accident or put in the wrong person. But for the most part, it's very secure. However, I'd argue that the single biggest benefit of email, and someone mentioned this on stage on Monday, is that is asynchronous. That's just a fancy way of saying that you can check it and send it when it's convenient for you. If I wake up at 2 AM, like I did this morning, I can send someone an email, and that email is not going to wake that person up unless that person's sleeping by his or her phone with the alarm turned on. So we check it, we send it when it's convenient for us. It's a very selfish medium if you think about it that way. So email confers major benefits, but we have gone way, way, way too far. In fact, 
email has become a scourge. Any Dilbert fans out there? This is one of my favorites. So is the problem really with email? I would argue no, the problem is, us, is with us, it's with how we use it. We love to blame technology because technology can't blame us back. Right? Email doesn't send itself. When we see horrible PowerPoint presentations, did PowerPoint auto-create something like that? No, someone sat down and said, I'm going to put 14 bullets on a slide in a 10-point font and expect people to squint to see them. So we love to blame technology. I always say, blame the Indian, not the arrow. If you hit a bad shot in golf, as I usually do, I'm tempted to blame my club, but my club had nothing to do with it. It was me. We spend most of our professional lives, or most of our waking lives, in front of a screen these days. And most of that time is spent on email. In fact, I shouldn't say most, but a decent percentage. Does anyone know, this is for a book, what percentage of time the average knowledge worker spends sending and receiving emails? Anyone? Lower. Lower. We'll give it to 25, close enough. It's actually 28%. So um, yeah, if we could get her a book, that'd be great. In many cases, that equates to three to four hours per day, every day. We often don't understand that because we're constantly checking our email. Now, this may seem like a big number. Let's say that you don't believe me. Let's do a little math. No book prize for this one. This one's too obvious. This equation's not going to make much sense to you, but hear me out. Let's say that you receive 150 emails per day. The average is around 120 to 150 based on my research. And let's say that it takes you just one minute to read and or respond to an email. Guess what? You're at 150 minutes, which is about two and a half hours. If you work eight hours in a day, give or take, guess what? you're at that number. But here's the rub, that number is only rising. You may be comfortable with the fact that you spend so much time in email, but something has to give. Email is growing at a rate of 15% per year. So let's do some more math. Let's say that you only receive 100 emails in a day. And I know some of you, I was talking to someone earlier on who said 500 emails in a day, that was you, right? Wow. Let's say that you go up by 15% per year. You're starting at 100. In five years, that number will double to roughly 200. It's an astonishing number. Something has to give. We can't cram more hours into a day. And it's numbers like these that has led Nick Bilton to say that there is no escape. Email is the most invasive form of communication yet devised. Bilton is a fascinating writer. He's a reporter for the New York Times, and he wrote the excellent book, Hatching Twitter. Anyone read that one? Really interesting book. I'm going to come back to Twitter in a bit. But so what? Right? You spend a lot of time sending email. Big deal, right? What's the effect on the bottom line? Well, as I argue in the book, relying on email so extensively is actually bad business. How bad? How about $1 trillion per year bad? And that's not my number. This comes from McKinsey. They did a study and in 2012 determined that a trillion dollars per year could be saved for organizations adopting collaborative tools in the enterprise. Now that number may not have any context for you. Think of it this way, Uber has a $51 billion valuation, that's 20 Ubers. In 2012, the United States gross domestic product was $15.4 trillion. So one trillion on top of that is about six, 7% savings per year. Most businesses would kill for a savings of a fraction of that. But that one trillion dollar number is huge. It's hard for us to get our arms around that. Is there a specific example in which in-person communication, talking to each other, would have solved the problem? The answer is yes. By the way, this is uh, end of season three, Breaking Bad. Favorite scene. When I was putting together this book back in February, I spoke at a large company in San Francisco. And the book hadn't come out yet, but they said, we need you here because we're suffering from some communication issues. He said, tell me a story. I said, okay. We have employees in San Francisco and employees in London. For two years, they've been sending emails back and forth about a data problem. 
Now, to be fair, data problems are sometimes very thorny. Before I started writing and speaking, I was an enterprise systems consultant. Some of the data problems that I had to address made my head hurt. But two years does seem like a long time, particularly for a company that has a great deal in the way of resources. It turned out that once these two groups got together in person for some sort of annual meeting, that thorny data issue that took two years of emails pinging back and forth was resolved within an hour. Oh, you meant this. I thought you meant that. No, no, no. And this begs the question, if email is so inefficient, so toxic in many organizations, and there are better collaboration tools available, then why do we rely on email so frequently? Why do we spend a third of our day many times in our inboxes? In other words, why can't we get off the email train? I told you I was bringing up this slide last night, Nathan. Well, the answer is mostly human. It's not technological. My background before I got into technology and consulting was in labor relations. I thought I wanted to work in HR. It really wasn't a good fit, but I always go back to the primary importance of people. Remember, we love to blame technology, but we choose the tools that we use. And these days, there are scores of more powerful and affordable alternatives out there. Maybe in 1998 or 2000, when there were nascent knowledge bases and intranets, but they were kind of clunky. But today, you've got to be kidding me. This is not 1998. I discovered a ton of different tools researching the book. Why can't we get off the email train? We're just used to it. Think about it. If you send 100 emails per day, five days a week, I'm going to give you four weeks for vacation, 48 weeks out of the year. That means that you send 24,000 emails in a year. If you do something 24,000 times in a year, you're going to get reasonably good at it. So email has become a habit. Next up, we're frequently overconfident that we're communicating effectively. And I'm going to bring up a little research on this later. Some fascinating stats about how we think we're being clear, but we're actually not. There's also this notion that email is official. Let's say, one of my favorite scenes, let's say that Mark and I go out to lunch and we're thinking about hiring Steve. And I tell Mark, I just don't know about this Steve guy. I think he's a troublemaker. And Mark goes, no, 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 I outrank you, we're going to hire him. And six months later, it turns out I was right. Steve was a bad apple. I'm joking, Steve, you're a good guy. And I go to Mark, I told you so. Well, let's say Mark won the lottery. He's no longer with the company. Let's say that Mark remembers that very differently. Let's say that Mark doesn't remember that lunch at all. I have nothing official. Email is an official way for me to document all of my concerns, and I sent more emails than I could possibly count in my career as a consultant documenting issues. So when I talk about us relying on email too much, I am as guilty as anyone up until recently when I had my moment of clarity. I was on a consulting project, and I was keeping everyone informed through emails. This was three, four years ago. And a woman came up to me and said, what's the status of the migration? I was moving systems around. It doesn't really matter here. What's the status? And I was a bit peeved, and I looked at her and said, didn't you get my email? And she said, which one? And it hit me. I was trying to communicate, but I was really just confusing people. So my heart was in the right place, but I realized that I was a big part of the problem. There's also this notion of covering your ass with email, right? Going on record, expressing a concern about something. And thanks to smartphones, again, email is everywhere. We don't have to go into an office. We just have to whip out our smartphones, and we can check and send emails. Many of us fear personal interaction. Think about it. I don't want to say something that might offend you. So I can write that email a few times, edit it, and then send it when it's been sanitized. Right? It's very difficult to take something back, particularly if you're a technology worker and you don't necessarily have the best people skills. We complain about email, yet we secretly crave it. And this is not just my opinion. Researching the book, I discovered that neurologists discovered that checking email and text messages releases dopamine into our brain's pleasure centers. It results in this obsessive compulsive behavior. Email actually makes us happy. It's also a cultural norm. In many, particularly mature organizations, they don't know anything else. When I was researching the book, I reached out to put some case studies in. And some people acted like I was from Mars. I'm sorry. Something like what Claire did, cutting the cord with email, that's insane. They can't even get their arms around it. It's just too familiar to them. So with all these limitations, it doesn't surprise me 
that many organizations haven't adopted these more superior collaboration tools. And again, I'm a curious guy, so I started to wonder why. A big reason is ignorance. We're simply unaware that there are better tools that are out there. For a free book, what character, what series? Gareth Theosoph. Do you get a second book? You got to give one to her. <laughs> Gareth from the English version of The Office, which for my money is a lot better than the American version. So many of us are ignorant that there are new tools out there. There's also general laziness. We just don't want to learn new tools. Again, if we send emails 24,000 times in a year, we get good at it. The crazy thing is that a lot of these collaborative tools, you're basically using. If you pick up something like when I played around with Slack or HipChat and you see the hashtags, well, guess what? If you're on Twitter, you're already using a hashtag. Facebook supports hashtag. That at symbol works in a very similar way across these different applications. But again, because we've mastered email, we're afraid to use new tools. We also love blaming the IT department, right? If IT would only give us the best tools. Well, if you haven't noticed, IT has kind of a lot going on with provisioning as well as little things like security threats. And I don't think that that argument really holds a lot of water these days because many of us bring our own devices to work. There's this term shadow IT. We're using applications and technologies whether IT likes it or not. Perhaps we'd be more willing to embrace new tools if we understood that email isn't nearly as effective as we think. In fact, email can cause general confusion and misunderstanding at work. And this happens even among people who have known each other for decades. This is the last book I'll give away if anyone gets this one. I'm getting there. Who are these guys? Very obscure. OK. It is a band. This is one of my favorite bands. They are called Marillion. They have released 17 studio albums in a career that has spanned three decades. They have played thousands of shows together. They've been to each other's weddings. They know each other really well. And I'm mentioning Marillion, not just because I'm putting in a plug for them, but because I've actually gotten to know them a little bit. And because I write for Huffington Post, I've been able to interview a number of the members. And not too long ago, I interviewed Mark Kelly. He's the keyboardist of the band, very nice guy, very talented guy. And before we got into an update with the band, what the band would be touring, he said, I want to talk to you about your new book. I said, OK. He said, it's an interesting story because our band recently had a disagreement over email with the drummer, the guy on the right, Ian Mosley, the drummer. And he seemed really upset. So they got on the phone and they called him. And they said, Ian, what's wrong? What, what do you mean? Well, from your email, you seemed really upset. He goes, I wasn't upset. Think about it. A band that's been together for more than three decades, played thousands of shows together, got into a disagreement or a misunderstanding over email. What does that say if your company employs 300 people or 3,000 people? What if they don't know each other? What if they come from different cultures? What if they don't know each other nearly as well? That's just the story. Let's go to some research. In 2006, Jason Kruger, or Justin Kruger, excuse me, of New York University and Nicholas Epley of the University of Chicago did some research, and they wanted to determine the efficacy of email as it related to in-person communication. Right? Are we really communicating well with each other? Interesting question. And they found that 80% of the time, participants believe, would believe that they were being clear with others. Others would understand their messages, irrespective of medium. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're emailing or if you're talking. What were the results? Well, they were a bit of a mixed bag. 75% of the time, listeners were able to correctly pick up on sarcasm and humor. So three times in four. Not great, but not horrible. With email, though, with text-based communication, only 56% of the time were they able to pick up on humor or sarcasm. This isn't totally unsurprising, because text lacks context. right? Yes, you can put an emoji or an emoticon, but we miss out on the nonverbal cues, your tone of voice, your facial expressions, right? cultural differences. Uh, in my third book, The New Small, I was talking to a guy who became a friend of mine. He said that when he was working with developers in India and talking on the phone, they would say, OK. He thought OK meant, I understand. But in reality, in India, OK meant, I heard you. That's a big difference. Once they started Skyping, they could see if someone said OK, but they really didn't seem like they got it. But that's not the worst part of this study. The worst part is that most people had no idea that they weren't making themselves clear. That's why I love that George Bernard Shaw quote so much. 
And this is a huge problem. We don't know that we're being unclear. Since you guys didn't get my Marillion reference, the next prize goes to whoever gets this one. Text-based co communication provides the illusion of clarity, but it's a false one. Yeah, rest of development, we'll go with Joe. So we'll, give her, we'll get her uh, this book. Right? It's a false illusion of clarity. Any rest of development fans out there? Love that show. I didn't want to put it in here because it's not safe for work, but Key and Peel, the comedy team, make this point perfectly. I urge you to Google Key and Peel text message, and it shows about how people are texting friends and they think they're being clear, but it escalates, and I'll just leave it at that here. Do not play this one at work. It is very funny. But what are the other effects of excess email? Well, using email too much actually makes us stupid. For example, if you show up to work having pulled an all-nighter, your IQ drops by 10 points. That might not mean very much to you because you don't have any context. I'm going to give you some. If you show up to work stoned, your IQ drops by four points. If you show up at work and constantly check email, your IQ drops by 10 points. In other words, you're better off showing up to work baked than you are constantly checking email. And this comes from Dr. Glenn Wilson at King's College in London. Gotta love the dude. And the hits just keep on coming. Email makes us confused and overwhelmed. Uh, Constant Contact did a study recently and determined that the single biggest reason for people unsubscribing to email lists was that they were receiving too much email. We make it really difficult to find key information. Researching the book, I discovered at the time, it's a bigger number now, that Google could index 20 trillion web pages. Trillion with a T, it's an astonishing number. But we've all had this problem. In an inbox of 20,000 messages, we can't find that message, right? And we search by dates, we search by keywords, we search by filters and flags, but we can't seem to find it. We also irritate customers and partners. But perhaps the single biggest problem with email the way I see it is that it contributes to this loss of focus. Some of you may know that our attention spans are declining. In 2000, the average American attention span was 13 seconds. Again, that number has no context for you. I'm about to give you some. Does anyone know what it is today? Yes, very good, eight. Does anyone know what it is for the average goldfish? Nine, we are trailing the goldfish. They can pay attention for longer than we can. This is why multitasking is a myth. You're not multitasking, you're multi-changing. This is why driving while texting is four times more dangerous than driving while you're drunk. At least when you're plastered, you're trying to pay attention. Is it any surprise that given all these problems, things fall between the cracks? But let's say that I could eliminate email, although that is not my goal. Would that fix the problem with business communication? Would it all of a sudden work? And I'd argue no. Email is only half of the problem. The other half is jargon. I don't know what omni-channel engagement mapping is either, by the way. So you know I'm a big fan of quotes. This is one of my favorites. Very obscure quote, but I love it. Being incomprehensible offers unparalleled protection against having nothing to say from the philosopher Alan de Baton. There are a lot of people who talk without speaking and I'm not talking about some mid-level manager. I'm talking about companies that, in some cases, are worth tens of billions of dollars, like, oh, I don't know, Twitter. About a year ago, Twitter released this vision statement. And I'll let you read it for a second, because if someone can explain to me what it means, I'd really like to know. This is a complete mess. I'm going to point out that this contains 220 characters. I'm doing that for a reason. Does anyone know the limit on the number of characters in a single tweet? 140. You could not even put this vision statement in a tweet. And I wasn't the only one who noticed the absurdity of this. Dennis K. Berman, the Wall Street Journal business editor, pointed out that it contains 35 words, 62 syllables, four clauses, and two grammatical errors. <laughs> Have you seen Twitter stock in the last year? I wanted to short it, but I have such a terrible record with investing. Twitter has gone like this because people don't know what Twitter is. Twitter fails the mom test. Moms get Facebook. Moms don't understand Twitter. It is chaotic. That Nick Bilton book I mentioned before, Hatching Twitter, is, should be required reading. It's a fascinating look. But enough picking on Twitter. 
This is a company that, for a press release, announced its new open source big data platform as a service offering. And I had to break this up. But this monstrosity contains 61 words and 380 characters. Now, to be fair, I know what a lot of these terms mean. I wrote a book about big data. I've touched on open source software in a number of my books. But I don't know what this is. I went to this particular vendor, CSC's, uh, booth at a conference in Las Vegas. And I went up to the guy, and he didn't know what was coming. And I said, you guys released that big data platform as a service product, right? And the guy goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard of it. He was so psyched. He wanted to tell me all about it. I said, no, no, no. Do you have any customers? And he responded with, oh, what do you mean by customer? Does anyone pay you to use it? Well, no. They don't even know what this is. My first book is about IT project failures. 60% of the time, IT projects ran over budget or passed their deadline, or didn't give users the functionality they wanted, or some combination. And people knew they were buying a back office system for payroll or financial. They knew they were buying a project management application or a customer relationship management application. What are your odds of success if you don't know what the hell you're buying? Well, it's a complex product. We have to explain it this way. Oh, really? Ask Einstein. Great quote. If you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. You should be able to explain your product, your service, your job to a child. I've explained big data to a teenager. I didn't do it by talking about distributed architectures and parallel processing. I did it by talking about Facebook, about YouTube, about Twitter. So let's say I've convinced you. How do we start communicating better at work? Here are my seven rules. And I will give a nod here to Bill Maher, host of Real Time. It's an OK show. I do like the new rules segment, though. The first up is to follow a three email rule and don't be afraid to invoke it. After three, it's time, as Claire mentioned, to pick up the phone. I will not engage in an email conversation because they basically don't work, or they only work about half of the time. This is my email signature. And I want to point out right at the bottom, the three email rule. Now, sometimes people don't see this. So I have a shortcut. We've reached the three email rule. Here's my phone number. Here's a link to my schedule. Let's talk. One of the most fascinating stats to me from this conference so far was from Michael, who mentioned that 77% of all employees don't use the enterprise collaboration tool they currently own. This is criminal. It's time for us to hold employees accountable. Love this scene. Some of you might not see. You know, he went through Breaking Bad so much, I feel like I don't need to see it. I was talking to someone from a startup in Las Vegas, not too far from where I live. And she knew about the book and said to me, hey, Phil, can I get your advice? Sure. There's an employee we just hired. She's a little bit older. She's 52, 53. And we try to use collaborative tools, but she won't. What should we do? Well, I don't want to be cruel, but there's a real problem. The information does not exist in a central repository. And if some people use the tool, but some people don't, it's time for us to hold people accountable. And I mentioned to my friend that she may want to have a conversation with this person that this is actually a big deal. I would also ban urgent emails. If something is urgent, you need to pick up the phone. The impact of removing a little button can be enormous. There was a French company I found out, a bank, a couple months after the book came out, and they took away Reply all. You know how much time the average employee saved? Every day, about two hours. Look for communication canaries in a coal mine. I was pitching a sponsor for my book tour six months ago. I actually ran through Austin. And I had a conversation with a PR person from a very prominent communications company. I won't name it, but everyone in this room has heard it. So we go back and forth over email, and I invoke my three email rule. Here's a link to my schedule. Here's my phone number. She responds with, no time to talk, have to do this over email. And I can be a little snarky. And I just, this was so good, I couldn't pass it up. That I hope you appreciate the irony here. You represent a company that's trying to do away with email, yet will only communicate with me via email. But I was glad that it happened, because if that company did sponsor me for the book tour, and if I needed to get in touch with her because a plane was delayed, or there was a change in plans, we couldn't find my books, whatever, my only way of getting in touch with her would have been email. Avoid the curse of knowledge. It's only natural for us to attain a certain expertise, a certain level of knowledge, and it happens to everyone. We forget that other people don't know what we know. 
when I was putting together that talk I mentioned before with that company, with people in London and people in San Francisco, I asked a friend of mine, because the book hadn't come out yet, if he wanted a galley of the book. His response, what the hell is a galley? A galley, for those of you who don't know, is just an electronic co copy, more or less a PDF, that becomes the book. But he didn't know that. He hadn't written. Was I trying to be arrogant? I don't think so. I just forgot that not every know, everyone knows what a galley is. So it's a natural human thing to just forget that other people don't maintain our level of expertise. I'm a big fan of saving your syllables. You will never, if I can help it, use the word, hear me use the word leverage. I would much rather use the word use, because eventually you will get to terms that are so um, polysyllabic that you can't compress them. And when I see examples of sentences or subtitles or article titles on the web that can be condensed, I say to myself, no one's hurting for content. Right? Who here has read every email or every blog post, followed every tweet, seen every Facebook update? Nobody. So it's important to save your syllables. For example, I came across this doozy in the book, how financial institutions can leverage their compliance initiatives to improve their business with a 360 degree view of the customer. I don't know what that means. How about this? Use compliance initiatives to better understand your customers. Now, I don't know what a compliance initiative is, but at least I know that it would help me, in theory, understand my customers. And then finally, always define your terms. Last year, right after I saw from Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston on Broadway, Fifth Row Center, he was playing Lynn B. Johnson, amazing performance. I went to a conference, and I went as a member of the media. Again, I write for HuffPo and Wired and a few other places. And about an hour into this talk from a senior executive, she kept using acronyms, right, ABC, XYZ. So finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I raised my hand and say, what do XYZ and ABC mean? And 200 people in the room looked, me, looked at me like I was crazy. And the woman explained what the terms are. We went back to work. Two hours later, I'm online getting lunch. And a couple people start pointing at me and walking to me. And I think I take someone off. I said, you're the guy who asked the question. I said, yeah. Said, we had the same question. I said, oh, are you with the media as well? What outlet do you write for? Said, no, 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 we work for this company. So the own employees <laughs> didn't know what the person was saying. And how can you possibly be successful if you don't know? That's my rant, and I'm sticking to it. Here's how you get in touch with me. And I think we have time for some questions. Okay, I have a couple, if you'll bear with me. The first one is, early on in your presentation, you talked about how we, if we do this 24,000 times, we're going to get good at it. And we're, and we're already doing that. So my first question would be trying to limit this, or, or particularly with your comment about it, that it releases dopamine and it makes us feel good. I mean, aren't you asking us to essentially go against human nature that have kind of... Well, how long has email been around? about 30 years, in the workplace about 20. So you could argue that human nature has evolved. It's always evolving. Nick Carr wrote a great book called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. Again, we choose the tools that we use. If the culture mandates that everyone sends a bunch of email, then are we doing it to feel good or are we doing it for other reasons? There are companies that have said, like Claire on steroids, we're not doing email. I profile one company in the book, Click Health. They're based in Toronto. 13 years ago, the CEO said, we're not using email internally. Why? because it's a way for someone else to plan your day. And they've created this really interesting, um, basically operating system for the enterprise, and it's evolved over the last decade. So I have a little bit of a hard time with the notion that we have to use email when there are other people and companies that prove otherwise. But you had another question? So the follow-up then is, um, I didn't, I, I may have missed, I think you did talk about some alternatives. Some of the things that maybe Claire talked about were let's say the tools within Central Desktop, for instance, where our firm uses the comments section and we, and we will put everything into you know, this tool, it, but you still lose the idea of talking face-to-face -face or in person. Is your prescription to get away completely from writing and text to each no, other in a business not at realm? all. Um, I like to think of a communication tool and email as, a, as each a club in the bag. 
So if you golf, you don't try to get out of the sand with your driver. You don't putt with your seven iron, unless of course you break your putter, which some golfers have done. So instead of looking at email as a Swiss army knife, right, or any one tool that can do everything, I completely agree with you. I don't know if there will be a tool that eliminates the need to have a conversation, but the choice is ours. A couple of, um, actually last year, I got a text message from a, one of my clients at a conference. We're really upset with you. I picked up the phone. I left a message. She sends me a text back. Can't talk. We're really upset with you. I picked up the phone again and said, I understand. Let's talk. I wanted to have that conversation in person, not over texting, because again, emojis aside, it's very difficult for us to represent. Um, it's, it's easy for us. This is why if I do a post for ink or something in the comments, invariably there is Phil as an idiot, right? Because with text, with anonymity, you can say things that you would never say in person. And I still don't think the prescription is to remove text-based communication altogether. Because to me, one of the biggest problems with email is that the information exists in a single discrete inbox. If that employee walks away, all that institutional knowledge can't be searched on. I'm not saying that performance reviews and everything else ought to be there. I'm not one of these um, lunatics on transparency altogether. But why can't something exist in a searchable network? I don't know the answer to that. Other questions? It could be about Breaking Bad. <laughs> it's like performance about Breaking Bad. So you can break your own internal culture around you know, email and, and using that as a primary means of communication, but how do you get customers to buy in, right? Because even if we broke it internally, I still deal with customers all day. They want to email us. Okay. What, what's the best way to break them? I believe that there is such a thing as bad business. And if a customer, customer I don't believe is always right. Um, if a customer has a few queries, you could always direct that person to a website. Right? My thinking is if someone asks me a question, I want to direct that person to a blog post because other people can discover that blog post. They don't have to find it in my email and copy and paste. Um, so there might, I mean, some companies will use automation, but that typically annoys people because it doesn't quite get to the question. Um, you could put in, as uh, some companies do, a chat window to encourage it, but point people to a common uh, resource like an internal website or intranet. But I'll, I'm a big believer in the cool hand Luke quote, sun men you just can't reach. Um, some people you may decide are just too needy and they don't want to do things in a way that most of your clients do and you have to ask yourself are those clients really worth keeping just because they're clients doesn't mean that you should ignore common sense and engage in email conversations with them replying all 57 times. <laughs>